Thanks, I'm Slater from Chelsea. And today I've been joined by Sid Chand Lau, manager of the Marlborough Multicap Income Fund. Hi, Sid. Hi, Sam. So this month marks the 10th anniversary of this fund. And over that time, it's returned around 150% compared to 93% for the sector average. So what's been the secret of the success over the past decade? Well, it isn't so much a secret that uh, what we do is invest across all market gaps in the universe. Um, by that, I mean the UK equity income sector. So I suppose the um, asset allocation, that is a key part of the alpha differential that you refer to. But really, I think we have to give credit to the companies themselves. It's, it's great companies and great management teams that I suppose, in the end, us fund managers take credit for. Um, clearly, part of that is also down to the judgment, um, which becomes a little bit more difficult to quantify. But really, if, if you look at it over a, a larger a sample, then you know any investment process, I think rather than just believing it, uh, that it works, you need a decent number of data points to look back and say, was the dividend sustainable? And I think over 10 years, we now have that. So if anything, it's been an iterative process where we have had our own learnings and improved it as we've gone along. And income's obviously a really big part of this fund. And there's been a recent report that said nine of the FTSE 100 companies actually have a yield over 7% at the moment. Rio Tinto was the highest with 12%, which is obviously an attractive number if you're an income investor. But how do you go about researching a company to see whether actually such a high yield is a sign of trouble or whether it's a fact that there's an opportunity there for income investors because growth investors just don't like the stock? Well, I'm quite careful of what you're describing, which is essentially a yield trap. So, you know, you have a very high yield, you should be suspicious of it. You know, is it purely that it's been oversold uh, and the stock is cheap? Well, on, on sort of textbook theory, that is one reason. Um, however, we, we must really sort of dig deeper and understand, is there some technical point? Is it a special dividend that perhaps has temporarily boosted the dividend total return. Um, because again, you know, as an income fund, we can't actually distribute certain types of special. They, they are considered capital. So that's not immediately attractive to me. But yes, I think as a, as a starting point, you look at that high yield that you describe 12% and you ask, well, you know, is it justified? Is that coming from the sale of a business? Is it uh, cash flow related? Is it earnings related? And, and to me, really the highest quality of, of dividend comes from the earnings itself, which should transpire into the cash flow. So, um, you know, just a high yield on its own is not enough. And the point I made earlier about sustainability, well, you know, can it pay 12% year after year? In all likelihood not. Um, however, that doesn't mean that there aren't good opportunities. There are certainly some companies out there in the UK, large and small, where you can pay four or 5% a year you can have decent capital appreciation. And the next year, it's still 4 or 5% because what's happened is the dividend has grown. It's grown along with the gap. So that, that can happen. And I think in, in those circumstances, it's a lot more attractive. And part of the job is really to sort of go in there and say, there's a high yield stock. Why is it high? Uh, is it also the situation that some of these companies have got high leverage? If there's a lot of debt on there, that's not very good because you know if you're insisting on paying a high yield when you're also struggling or finding it difficult to service your debt, that I think is a sign of trouble ahead, really. And it would be one we would avoid. So while there are opportunities in, let's say, medium to high yield, the very high yield stocks, I'm not saying that you can't pay them, but you've got to ask how it's being financed. Is it a debt finance dividend? And are you comfortable with that? Because sometimes the debt might be there very temporarily. It might be because there's been an acquisition, there's been some other corporate activity and the debt is only transient or temporary. So, um, yes, I think quite, quite certainly there are, there, there are many areas to look uh, and, and try and work out what is a realistic and underlying level of ongoing dividend that you should expect from a business of this nature. And the fund tends to have a bias towards small and mid caps, firstly, because it's an area of 
um, expertise with the company, um, but also because you believe in the power of compound dividend growth over time. Can you perhaps explain what you mean by this in layman's terms and maybe give us an example? Well, without sort of trying to patronise anyone, I'm sure that there, are, there are better explanations than, than I can give. But if I was simplifying it, um, it's, 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 you know, would you prefer getting a 4% uh, dividend that you take out each year? Uh, and if you look at that over a long period of time, you can also have the option of reinvesting the dividend. And, and that's not just, it doesn't just stop at dividend. You can look at that as a total return as well. So that would be split between what's known as the income distribution share and the accumulation share in, in the way I've, I've described it in that order. So really over, let's say, nine years, uh, you could be getting, or, or even take it as eight years, you could be getting 4.5% in dividends and 4.5% in capital appreciation. And if you combine that, that's your 9% of the year. If you take that out, it's 9%. Assume you get that every year, fantastic. But equally, after eight years, you've only got 72. I say only. Uh, that would have been closer to 100% had you reinvested it on your same capital base of 100. So, so that is a huge difference. You know, over one or two years, it doesn't look very big. But over nine years, that's a lot. Or over eight years, sorry, that's a lot. So that is also actually what I've described. It is known as the rule of 72. Uh, in, in the, the compounding theory, it's, it's a very well-known rule, and it's a mathematical um, result, if you like, which which encourages uh, compounding. And you know, the power of compounding is is well known. And obviously, last year, dividends across the world got cut, and in the UK, some companies took that opportunity to reset their dividends to a more sustainable level. Do you think it's actually been healthy for the UK market? Or does the UK market have such a history of yields and dividends that actually you think that the level could come back quite quickly? Well, when I look back on it, I think there were certainly two types of company. There was the company that got worried and said, we need to cut because we're not sure about what's happening. And, and that's totally understandable. And then there was the other type of company which cut because they genuinely had no cash flow, no earnings. There was no business. So you have to sympathize with that. I think possibly where it becomes a little bit more questionable as to why the, there was a cut and why it hasn't since been restored uh, is where the companies have traded incredibly well all the way through. And they have no particular need for furlough money or government help. Um, if anything, they've, they've actually been a beneficiary. So, so I think in that situation, it is, it is questionable. But yeah, I think three, three scenarios there on, on, on companies that cut dividends. Certainly, there was the banking sector, which sort of took direction from the regulator that you must be careful. And of course, what we saw was that the impairments or the rate of, of default was not as high as perhaps previous big financial crises. So the banking sector has since been told by the Bank of England, in fact, as well, that they can pay dividends as normal. So that's come back fairly quickly to answer your question, Sam. Um, although there has been a slight sort of uh, tilt towards rebasing, I think in that situation, it's healthy uh, because you can only pay what you can afford. Equally, it does set you up very nicely for dividend growth going forward because you're coming off a much lower base now. Um, now, there are some companies that have gone from 4% to 2% uh, you know, through a sort of corporate demerger and said, well, we've got reduced earnings, but we'll also take that as an opportunity to pay less. And I think that is perhaps where there's a bit more of a management ideology that's kicked in. It's not what the shareholders necessarily want. Um, but, you know, there are companies that have, as I say, traded all the way through and you kind of question why they aren't paying dividends now, considering most companies have restored them, actually. Uh, when I look across our portfolio, there's, I think, three companies left out of 120. And again, even there, there are strong indications that they will be paying dividends quite soon. So, yes, the, the, the broad-based index level is about 2.8 percent um, and a number of our companies are paying in excess of that on average. That's great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And if you'd like to find out more about the Marlborough Multicap Income Fund, please go to chelseafs.co.uk.